welcome to Skeptics in the Pub. We're an online um, coalition of skeptics groups from around the UK. Uh, we were born out of the uh, COVID pandemic to continue doing the talks that we would normally do in the pub once a month. But now we have uh, regular talks online um, every single week to give you, you know, your regular dose of science, reason, and critical thinking during the pandemic. Uh, judging by the way things that are going, the way things are going, uh, we will probably be doing that for a while longer. We've been doing this since March, so um, hopefully, you, if you, if this is your first time here, you will be able to uh, attend some of our future talks. If not, then you can always visit the YouTube channel. So we have a YouTube channel where all of the Skeptics in the Pub online um, talks are posted. Well, most of them are anyway. Um, so just to give you a bit of a rundown of the night uh, before I introduce the speaker, um, if you want to donate to just the running costs of keeping everything going during these um, weekly talks, we'll be putting a link down in the chat. Um, and also we'll be taking questions. Now we'll be taking questions via Slido. Uh, that Slido link will also be down via the chat and it's um, sli.do slash raptor, but the link will be down in the chat. Um, so if you, if you put your questions in there or even if you don't have a question, but you look at that Slido and you say, oh, that's a really good question, you can upvote those, um, those questions so that the really interesting questions will float up to the top and those will be the most likely to be answered. Um, now if you want to just kind of keep up and chat with people via Twitch, that would be great. All of the sort of chatting is going to be happening happening via Twitch and we have a moderator in there to make sure that everything is fine and everything stays polite. Thank you Brian for, for playing that role tonight. Um, and uh, if you say something that, that kind of goes against our community guidelines, we will be uh, uh, monitoring that. So please just make sure that you are being polite. So tonight we have Izzy Lawrence. You've probably all seen the blurb, but it is the age old question. The thing that we've all been wondering about suffragettes versus velociraptors. How have two of the coolest things in history been misunderstood. Now, I know I have misunderstood it, being the age that I am. I didn't even know most, most dinosaurs had feathers until recently. So Izzy's probably going to touch on these sorts of things. So um, the, the title of the talk pretty much speaks for itself. But if you ever wonder which of the two might win in a fight, hopefully Izzy is going to answer that tonight. So Izzy, is a comedian, uh, a writer, and a podcast host. And um, her most recent book is The Unstoppable Letty Peg, published by Bloomsbury earlier this year. She's the pre presenter of BBC Radio 4's Making History. Uh, she has the British Museum member cast, Terrible Lizards, and the Z-List Deadlist podcast. Um, <laughs> I've listened listen to some of these. They're great. You should go and have a listen after Lizzie's talk. It might also sort of help, you know, reinforce any of the lessons you learned tonight. Um, so she's also a comedian and something I just learned tonight, the voice of Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. So any of you listeners who uh, wondered, you know, who says you're listening to Skeptic's Guide to the Universe? I don't have a good voice, so I can't really do it. That is Izzy. So welcome, Izzy, and thank you for coming tonight. Well, thank you very much for having me. And it is a pleasure to be here, even though I cannot really see any of you or anything like that. Hello. Thank you very much for having me. And you're listening to the Skeptics Guide. No, you're not. You're listening to me talking about um, a few of my favourite things. Now, um, I, I've, I decided to do this talk mainly because I'm obsessed by two things. One of them is feminism. Uh, the other one is history. And the third thing is dinosaurs. Now, already some of you will have noticed that um, I am not very good at, um, what's it, being accurate. And I found that Skeptics Talk, this is very useful because most of you, bless you, Skeptics, are pedants. And I love to wind up pedantic people. One, because it's easy. And three, exactly. So let's crack right on. Um, I've got the slides up. Hopefully you can see them. Um, 
I imagine you can. This is this is my first slide. Now, when I put the question suffragettes versus velociraptors, that's literally because I had a bad dream and that's what was in it. So, you know, because these are two of my obsessions. And this is the image that I think a lot of us have. Um, we have the image um, that, you know, velociraptors, what do we know about them? We know they're very large. We know they're very scary. We know they're very clever. Clever girls is the subtext of this entire talk, by the way. Well done of those of you who've already got that. And what do we think about um, suffragettes? We think they're very meek. We think they're very polite. We think they're very you know, vulnerable, but ultimately justified in all of their actions. And so, as you can see from the slide, uh, they're basically going to get eaten. Now, why am I qualified to talk about this? Well, I'm not qualified to talk about absolutely anything, uh, really. I did write a book on suffragettes, but it is for kids. Uh, it's called The Unstoppable Letty Peg. It is here. Please buy it. Uh, it's very nice. It's very thick. You get a lot of get a lot of words in there. On this on this page, it says, "Marvelous, are you hurt?" So, you know, it's a good it's a good read. Um, but it is for eight plus. I know some 60 year old males who have loved it. Um, but yes, it's all about it's set in 1910 to 1911. So just before things got uber spicy. But it does include Black Friday, which we will cover in this talk. And I also um, present Terrible Lizards, which is a new podcast that me and a man called Dr. Dave Hone, who is a proper paleontologist from a plop plopper a plopper university yeah um but you know he knows all about dinosaurs i love dinosaurs so i ask him questions about dinosaurs and we have really great guests on there so um our velociraptors episode which you were all encouraged to watch which if you have you're gonna know everything i'm gonna say but never mind um but the velociraptors episode um, we had pen gillette on it well-known skeptic we've got robin ince coming up in the series we've got phil plate the bad astronomer coming up in this series we've also got rebecca watson coming up in this series so do um check out terrible lizards it's partly why i'm here and yes as um you already know me there's a picture of me looking ever so determined with better non-covid hair uh so do my ted talk because i'm important yeah yeah, that's the way you should listen to me. So, um, basically, for those of you expecting some really in-depth, serious science and history, you're not going to get that. You're going to get effectively battle cards, which is what I would call top trumps, but uh, I won't because it mentions a president. Um, so, this is what we're, we're going to do. Um, there is a joke in the slide for environmentalists, if you notice when the suffragettes' dates are. I also want to point out that there are stipulations of this. I'm talking about uh, the suffragettes, which was the name given by a newspaper, and I think about 1906, to the suffragists who joined the WSPU, or WISPU, as it's talked, called in my book. Uh, but uh, the WSPU is the Women's Social Political Union. Uh, and so we're talking about them, not the suffragists, them specifically. Um, and Velociraptor, uh, we're talking about Velociraptor mongoliensis. So that's that's the Velociraptor we're talking about. And if you know anything about either of these things, you're going to know why I want to do this talk. Um, so first of all, we're, we're going to frame this in terms of an actual fight if we were playing top trumps, because what else would you do? So the size, the major deciding factor in all fights is basically body weight. That's what is going to decide who wins against what and how. So as, as I explained at the beginning, this is the image that we all have. The velociraptors um, are really going to be the dominant. You know, they're going to be huge or at least the size of a, a human equivalent weight, probably. And um, they're going to be in groups and the women will be all on their own. Uh, this sort of thing. Now, the size is an issue, as a few of you already know and already screaming into your laptops and TVs and phones. Uh, you know that the, the size isn't what it is. And the man we have to blame for that really is Michael Crichton, who wrote Jurassic Park. Now, he's a weird one because he researched a lot. He really did. He wrote like, you know, he wrote these books, he did the research. And then when he did the research, he entirely ignored it. So the story behind the Velociraptor. So um, is basically, well, there was a book called Predatory Dinosaurs of the World. And this was written by a guy called Greg Poole. Um, he was a paleo artist, though he was actually a paleontologist as well. He had several scientific papers published. And he reclassified the Velociraptor as um, the same genus, not species, the same genus as um, uh, Dionychus. And I have to be careful when I say Dionychus. Dionychus. 
Deinonychus. I hate I hate the word. It sounds like a Roman soldier to be Deinonychus. Now Deinonychus is the top one. So if you have a look, there's Deinonychus looking all a bit like the Velociraptor from the movies. And then you have that little one down there that look a bit like a KFC bucket. That there is Velociraptor mongoliensis. Now there is a difference, a size difference between these two. So um, Deinonychus is about um, from nose to tail, it's about 3.4 meters long. Um, it's from North America. Um, along with a lot of the other dromosaurs, whereas a um, Velociraptor mongoliensis from Mongolia is about two metres long snapped tail and much smaller. You know, standing up, you know, Deinonychus might be able to get up to, if it's on its hind legs, six foot, whereas a Velociraptor mongoliensis will get to about your waist height. Not so much the sort of terrible lizard that you would imagine. Now, um, and people think, OK, so in the films, Deinonychus is obviously the Velociraptor in the films. That makes a lot of sense. But in the book, he actually makes a point. Grant makes a point in the book of saying that they got the genetic material for the Velociraptor from the Velociraptor mongoliensis, not from Deinonychus. Why? Why does he do that? Well, because he's a writer. And if, you, if you're an author like I am, you know that you're an artist. And let's face it, Velociraptor is a great name. Now, Dionychus is actually a good name when you think about it, because it actually means terrible claw, because they've got that claw. Right. And so it's, it's a good name, but it does, like I say, sound like a Roman soldier. You're not going to be scared of Dionychus, are you? You're going to be scared of a velociraptor, and it's shortened to raptor in the book, and that's really exciting, and nobody knows what a raptor is. Um, and so, you know, for legitimate reasons, that's good. But why he didn't say it's from Deinonychus or even a Utah raptor, which is even bigger and even more frightening. I don't know. I think because he's a bit of an idiot. So if we put them next to our suffragette, you've got Deinonychus, which comes up to about her shoulder. And you've got the Velociraptor, which comes up to about, well, not even her waist, really. And that's um, Princess Sophia Singh. Um, she was a famous suffragette. Um, she was um, actually weirdly from Norfolk. Her dad was from India and basically lost his. He was he's like um, he was he was a Raj. He lost his land to the Raj. Um, he was basically a teenager and Queen Victoria nicked it off him. But she thought him very pretty, so she was godfather of like his daughter, who was Princess Sophia Singh, and she was quite a radicalised suffragette. She went to um, India, I think, in 1903, and got quite excited by the idea that actually the men in charge weren't very nice to people particularly Indian people and as she you know claimed a background with them uh, she was a bit you know upset by this so um, but there she is and as you can see I think Deinonychus would finish her off in terms of scale and size I don't think she'd have much of a chance but what about against Velociraptor I mean look all she'd really have to do is flump on it wouldn't she she'd just be able to just you know she could take her coat off and just cover it with it I don't think like Deinonychus it's going to be maybe it's not going to be equal weight because you know this is the thing about dinosaurs they've got hollow bones they're a bit like birds in that sense birds are dinosaurs by the way guys I know but um, Velociraptor is probably only going to weigh Mongoliensis is about twenty kilos which is not a lot I think she can deal with that she can even hit it with that newspaper that she's selling that's some um, suffragette which is weird it's weird that she's selling the suffragette and not votes for women so that probably means it's after nineteen twelve but we can come along to that so basically what I'm saying is in terms of size and scariness even Deinonychus probably isn't the size of the Velociraptors in the Jurassic Park movies so you've got to get those images out your head replace it with you know something a bit smaller still fighty bitey and you know like I say Velociraptor really quite you know we're thinking large turkey that's the sort of size we're thinking. So let's move on to agility, speed, flexibility and training regime. Now obviously um, we don't know what Velociraptor and Deinonychus' training regime was. If you have a look at some of the paleo art out there, it was extreme. Right, this is a drawing that I did, but it basically encompasses how I see most dinosaurs represented in books and everything else. They're always like, you know, kung fu madness. If humans were alive at the same time as dinosaurs and we found representations of them in the past, I imagine like in museums and stuff, you'd see them represented in this sort of way. So, um, Yes, what we do know, though, is the Velociraptor itself uh, was very agile. So um, if you have a look at a Velociraptor now in the films and stuff, they say that, oh, it could reach a top speed of 50 miles an hour. Could it? 
it could it could not at all <laughs> i mean very few animals can do that even really speak fast animals like you know cheetahs and ostriches can only just for a very short period of time it hasn't got the body of an ostrich it hasn't got that really short femur it hasn't got the ability to you know rush at that speed however it is a fast animal it is light it is quick it is obviously very agile and, and built for speed in that sense um it's also weirdly because we're used to like you know most um like tyrannosaurs and that sort of thing all have very short arms I and mean, you think t-rex is short arm you should check out my favorite dinosaur which is a bellysaurus uh which which literally has like it's it's ridiculous it has like tiny tiny little stubs you know almost like you know it's wearing sort of an exotic bra it's ridiculous um there's a really what one of the things on my um on my podcast which i should very quickly say the reason that they think that they might have these short arms and why they're residual is because in order to have the strong neck which holds up the big tyrannosaur head with a massive jaw because that's all t-rex are they're basically just mouths with feet right in order to keep all this musculature in place you actually need the shoulder blades and if you need the shoulder blades it's very difficult to get rid of the arms entirely you still need something there to attach all of this neck muscle to anyway that's got nothing to do with the velociraptor however this does um they've got like i say they've got really long arms which would help them turn very quickly we're going to go on to it in a sec but they've also got feathers and this is one of these things that you know it was in the sort of late 80s, early 90s, and then really not really sort of like you know underlined until I think they found they they said about velociraptors and feathers, I think in 2007 was a definite, definite, it's definitely had feathers. Because we don't actually have many um, examples of Velociraptor, but we do have um, examples um, of Velociraptor from 2007. It's ulna. There's, there's this bone here. And on its ulna bone, it's got these little dips. And you find those little dips on any bird basically larger than a turkey, which has long wing feathers, because those are the quill knobs where the quills slot in. Can you imagine? Can you just imagine plucking? OK, you know, I, I have to wax occasionally. The idea of plucking a quill, ah, that, that, that must hurt. But the, the whole thing is it's got these feathers, long feathers on its arm. Now, the reason that's amazing for agility is if you look at ostriches, they use their arms all the time. They're using them as air brakes. They can twist and turn. In a fight, this could be really useful because it would be able to not only confuse with its like um, with its feathers, but it'd also be able to quickly change direction. It might even be able to increase its jumping height. So we're talking about an extremely agile creature. What about suffragettes? Now, believe it or not, this is mainly what my book is about. It is the fact that suffragettes did jujitsu. They did watsu, jujitsu, the ancient Japanese martial art of basically attacking and defending yourself against sword wielding samurai warriors or in the suffragettes case, Policemen. Now, policemen are very easy to defend yourself against because they're six foot tall. In 19, um, I think it was uh, 1899, there was a, the remit that London police, the Met Police, had to be six foot minimum height. Um, they were also mainly ex-soldiers from the Boer Wars when that ended in 1901. And they were very, they were tall, they were muscular, and their basic practice was, if I don't understand, hit it. Good thing police have changed since then. Um, but yes, so the suffragettes... Um, initially didn't want to be arrested well initially actually sorry initially the suffragettes wanted to be arrested because this was excellent publicity for them because the image of a woman being arrested was a very very sort of like um you know, it was very emotional for people. They went, oh, goodness, these women are being arrested. Whatever for? What have they done wrong? Why? They're merely asking for the right to be heard, for their voice, the woman's right for a vote. How how terrible. And so it's just a great way of generating money. Get arrested. Have your picture taken in the paper. Woe is me. Thanks very much. But then what was happening was they weren't being treated as political prisoners. So when they weren't treated as political prisoners, they thought, right, we'll starve ourselves and that will force them to give us, to make us first class prisoners. We'll be able to write letters. We'll be able to generate more money. This is what we want. So they starve themselves and they began, and you know, if you have a political prisoner starving themselves in prison or any prisoner starving themselves in prison, you have to feed them because if, if they die, that's on you. So they were force fed and it, the stories of being force fed are gross. It's literally like up the nose and the mouth and that sort of thing. The middle class women, by the way, that was only working class women. Middle class women, like there's an image of Emmeline Pankhurst being force fed. And it's literally her being offered a spoon and going, no, thank you. I cannot. 
So there were differences in class as to how you were treated as a suffragette. But a lot of them were imprisoned, but this is what they wanted. It wasn't until 1913 when they introduced the Cat and Mouse Act, which is basically, you know, the government said, well, we can't have all these women starving themselves to death. This is making us look really bad. I tell you what, we'll starve, they can starve themselves up until the point where they get really critically ill and then we'll let them go. And then when they get better outside of the prison... We will rearrest them again and put them back in the prison, back in the same. And it's a bit like a cat playing with a mouse. This is what, you know, it's like, like, oh, it's dead. Oh, no, it's not. I'm going to get it. Oh, it's nearly dead. Oh, it's not. And this sort of like dragged out the torture for months and months and months and months. So when the suffragettes did not want to be arrested, they called on um, the... Um, they called on the skills of Edith Garrard, who was a woman who trained in jiu-jitsu. She trained in the Golden Square Dojo, which was a famous mixed-up martial arts dojo in Soho. Mixed martial arts, that's right. It was started in like the 1890s, and they had people who not only learnt um, jiu-jitsu, but also swinging and wonderfully named Bartitsu. Um, Bartitsu was Edward Barton Wright's type of, he basically invented, he mixed all of these martial arts and it was a gentleman's martial arts wearing bowler hats and canes and long cloaks and using all of the accoutrements of a gentleman in order to be able to defend himself. And um, Edith Garrod adapted this for women to stop themselves being arrested by the police, which is where you get these images from. You get them from events where women had to defend themselves and actually knew how to, and they regularly trained. They had a bodyguard, which consisted of about 30 women, and they got into a lot of japes. I mean, if you don't think, and people still do this to this day, I do it, that is me throwing my friend Sunil over my shoulder in a throw called Siotoshi. He is attacking me with a metal chain in that picture. I don't know if you can see that. He swung it at my head and I've got in under him. Um, but you can see back in um, the um, early 1900s, there's a lady also throwing somebody Siotoshi. And there is my friend Sam throwing a man to the floor who is much bigger than she is. Uh, she's about Edith Garrett's size. Edith was um, four foot 11. So, you know, we about the same size as a velociraptor. And uh, yes, and uh, there is um, Sam stomping on his head or would be. But we're obviously doing it in safe and it is training. If it was in the street, maybe not. Um, but the idea that these women were completely defenceless and also not agile and not training is ridiculous. I mean, this is the 19, the early 1900s with boon in the health industry. People, those vegetarian restaurants popping up everywhere. The suffragettes used the Gardner restaurant. They were really into keeping health, keeping strong. And so, yeah, agility wise, they were, you know, you think of women all sort of like, you know, oh, I can't, I can't do anything. But actually they were quite seriously, you know, scary. So next one, armour. Um, I'm going to put this as defence technique. Now, we've discussed velociraptors being covered in feathers. Here is one, um, thank you, Wikipedia, beautifully drawn. Um, but um, yeah, you can see that now we know that because they're covered in feathers, I've already explained how they might be able to use these as a defence, just as shielding and everything else. But also some, like specialised birds, like pigeons, use feathers as a defence technique. So if you attack them, they will basically just go, you know, explode and all their feathers will come out and it's a way that they can escape. I don't think this is true for the Velociraptor because it is such a specialised predator and also... At the time it was around, um, there weren't any other larger predators going after it. So it might have been something that it used to fight each itself, but there isn't any evidence that it would be able to do this. So were feathers useful for armour? Probably not. Um, the other thing it could do in specific defence against a suffragette who knew jiu-jitsu, though, which is why we're here, how would a velociraptor defend itself against a suffragette? And it's this misconception that we have about velociraptors. Almost anybody, when you think of velociraptors, you think of either the basketball team, or you think of somebody doing this, going, Rah! this is how everybody does the dinosaur arms. They do the T-Rex arms like this, they do the dinosaur arms like this. This, you know, there's a velociraptor on the screen who is playing basketball. Now, I'm going to hate to ruin this for you guys. Velociraptors can play basketball. They couldn't do this. This is impossible for a velociraptor, which makes most wrist locks really difficult because what they had is um, in their wrist, I think this was, oh, who was it? Who I think, hang on, I'm just going to just, I think it was Ostman. I've got, I've got this in notes somewhere on my screen, but I can't read it. It is too much. So um, I think it's Ostman. If it's not Ostman, he's the guy who discovered Dionona because he discovered that this wrist bone they've got, and it's called the semilunar or the semilunate um, carpal. So it's in your wrist. And this is unique to both velociraptors um, and dromaeosaurs and birds okay so what it is it's uh, it basically means if you imagine judo chopping so you're going like this 
a bird can then take this little finger and place it easily on their ulna like that. They can just literally fold. This is really useful in flight. Now, obviously, velociraptors couldn't fly, which makes me think they were using this for turning and aerodynamic speed. Actually, I've got a picture of it. There it is. So it's it's that W99. That's what I'm talking about. Now, this means that you can't do wrist lock three, which is um, um, kotagatami is what we call it, which um, basically... Um, if you do this to yourself, it hurts. And ultimately, if you do that to somebody, you hold their arm there and just go like that, they will basically headbutt your knee in order to escape the pain and stopping you breaking their wrist. That wouldn't be able to happen with a velociraptor. You're already, that's that's one of the six wrist slots down, guys. So this is a really good, this is really good defense, is what I'm saying against a suffragette. <clears throat> Weapons, so, <laughs> who's carrying, man? So, um, now, suffragettes, while they learnt jiu-jitsu, they also learned other techniques. So they used Indian clubs and they actually had dresses, but they could like put these Indian clubs in on their body and they would swing them round and literally stop the police being able to get close to um, um, people like um, Emmeline Pankhurst, who they're trying to defend and, and, and stop um, being arrested. Uh, famously, this happened in 1914. Um, um, and it was called the Glasgow Riots. I think I've got this on my notes again. See, it's not called the Glasgow Riot. Like the March Battle of Glasgow. There we go. Uh, the, what happened was, and there's a beautiful story of all these women travelling on the slow train up to Glasgow because they were trying to save money. They didn't buy a, like an overnight um, a carriage. They just sort of sat there with their skirts, with all of these clubs sort of like over the, in their bodies, unable to get um, any sleep. Anyway, they went to is it St Andrews Hall. I think at St Andrews Hall in Glasgow. Big, you know, I think it's like a 5,000 seater. It's a lot, right? And um, Emmeline Pankhurst had a warrant out for arrest and she was booked to speak at this hall. How was she going to get in? Well, she bought a ticket. Genius. Okay, so she bought a ticket, sat in the audience, and then they announced her. The police were like, oh, because they were all there guarding the entire place, ready to arrest her. She gets on stage, starts talking. Now, the police move in to arrest her, but the bodyguard are there, armed with Indian clubs and other weapons. And basically, the fight lasted over eight minutes. And sometimes some people have recorded it. And let's face it, 4,500 people witnessed this fight. And it lasted between eight minutes and 11 minutes. I want to remind you how long boxing matches last. OK, there were police who were hospitalised after this particular incident. Um, the suffragettes went down with a definite fight. They could definitely you know, use weapons. Other weapons they used includes things like bombs. They like to bomb buildings. They actually got some of their bombs from um, czarist people leaving Russia, escaping Russia at the time. They also like to put phosphorus in post boxes so to set the post on fire. So they knew how to do incendiary devices. Um, I say they knew how to do that. A lot of suffragettes were not very good at this and didn't really understand the need to get to the post box quite quick before the phosphorus revealed, because it was like soaked in a Vaseline substance or something that evaporated. And so as it evaporated, um, obviously once it wasn't coated anymore, phosphorus reacts with air and therefore would set itself on fire. They didn't really understand this. So a lot of women just set themselves alight on their way to a post box, um, which meant there was quite a number of arrests in like 1913 and 1912 of women with severe burns uh, but there we go uh, so and, and they also um, um, they smashed they had hammers and they smashed windows and glass and things like that so they were armed let's face it they were pretty they were pretty um, dangerous people uh, velociraptors famously have this famous clucked craw this is their famous one they've got a let's talk about their face first they've got this good amount of sharp teeth but they don't have much of a bite they're not like t-rex with all this sort of built up muscle they've got quite a light bite so they're not going to offer too much um, difficulty there they'll be able to hang on but you know probably less than a dog bite i would imagine um their claw though now this is always this sort of cocked i think it's their second toe is their cocked claw that's meant to sort of like you know come and stab down um this isn't going to offer much of a this isn't much of a you know uh, I mean, what, what I mean is this has been misrepresented by a lot of um, art and everything else, because if you actually look, we've got Microraptor's claws and it's about almost it changed the entire shape of the claw is the is the what's it called? The sheath on it. What's it called? The cartonagin? No. Cart Carter? Carter Page? No. Carter. Who's Carter? Look who's Carter. What's it called? The cat? Uh, cartinous sheath i think it's called cartinous does that sound right to you i think it sounds right to me anyway basically 
you know, it, it changes the entire shape of the claw. Now this, people think, oh, this would be great for slashing. That's why you get those pictures of Deinonychus sort of like all sort of stood up and rearing like this. It wasn't used to that. It's not sharp enough. It's too heavy, too wide. It's used for puncturing, which is what the feathers are used for. The dinosaur feathers are actually a weapon because what um, velociraptors and actually other raptors, modern birds of prey do this. If you see a big bird of prey go after a rabbit, this is what it does. It, it basically, it mantles. They call it mantling the prey. So they land on it. So they run up, land on it, pin it with those claws, pin it with its claws, and then it uses its feathers to sort of trap it, engulf it, while it attacks with the beak and rips it apart. And that's probably what Velociraptor was doing. It's got the added advantage of having actual snatching claws as well, but the main damage was probably done with the face and with these claws, and the, the feet claws are used to just pinning down and piercing, uh, which is very, very cool. Um, also remember that they've got this amazing wrist, so they could do throwing stars. We haven't found any throwing stars in the fossil record, but they would be very good at that. Um, so, yeah. Um, now let's talk about, whoops, sorry. Let's talk about searchability, which they're gang size. Now, the suffragettes kind of win on this one. Uh, the suffragettes had a big gang. And you might think this would be absolutely incredible and they'd, they'd beat everybody. Because look, look at that Votes for Women demonstration back in 1908, organised by the WSPU. How amazing is that? But also remember the factionalism went on. The factionalism was intense. So they, the militant strategy of Pankhurst was kind of, you know, it was extreme. I don't know. People ask me because when I go into like into schools and talk about, hey, suffragettes, everybody's like, I want to be a suffragette. And I'm like, you'd be a terrorist. OK, they're quite scary people. You know, many people would rather be a suffragist. Suffragists are quite nice. They're the sort of more Gandhi like people who just want to stand there and reasonably speak. The suffragettes want to say they say, well, men don't listen to us because we aren't men. So let's behave more like men. Let's smash stuff. That's how to get a man's attention. And that's kind of what they did so um yeah and so there's a lot of factionalism i think it was um Hethic lawrence who um, basically was the treasurer of the wspu famously left in 1912 after there was this sort of uh, the votes for women magazine which isn't the suffragette magazine that sophia singh was holding at the beginning that basically you know the, the, it, it got um what's the word litigated against everybody involved in it got arrested and it was defunded and um Patrick Lawrence and her husband had to spend um I think nine months in prison for inciting violence because of this magazine and they were against violence themselves this is what resulted in a massive split so they were really good at unity at get, making medals for themselves um, um Sylvia Plankhurst and um, Emmeline's daughter was a particularly good marketer and she was amazing at getting everybody together and making sure everybody who'd been to prison got a little badge and making sure that Selfridges that very feminist um department store and it was proper feminist because it was the first place in London to ever have like public toilets for women that wasn't like in a park so yay um good old Selfridges but yeah that th th she organized all of this marketing and managed to get people grouped together and helped organise some of the photo shoots and that's her talking by the way the big hat um, she's not actually reading my book I might have photoshop that in but shh um, but yeah they were really good and they helped like them, the woman in the wheelchair um, which isn't a wheelchair it's a tricycle um, that's Mary Billinghurst who went on all the protests and got attacked by the police quite a lot and turfed out of her tricycle but she still carried on she's a hero anyway point is there's a lot of division in this movement because they were very um, politically charged um, whereas velociraptors in terms of groups and hanging out together we don't know they had quite a big brain but not a massive brain so they weren't like in the movies oh clever girls that sort of le level of communication we don't think but we've got no evidence that they weren't there are a few sites in north america where you've got um lots of uh, dinonychus teeth around areas where her herbivorous dinosaur um i think oh i see this is i think it's tentonosaurus tentontosaurus um it's basically a big herbivore um and the idea was that maybe Dionychus was going after these big herbivores together in a sort of like, you know, let's do this in a sort of like clever girls sort of way. Let's get. But there's no real evidence for this. It could have just been, you know, there's no you can't you can't say, oh, we found all of these broken teeth and therefore all the dinosaurs broke their teeth together. They could have just broke it in the same place day after day. It could have been, you know, you just don't know these things. And you can't. It's a bit like, say, imagine if you found like, you know, Dionychus 
what, you know, there's definite proof somehow in the fossil record that it was in a pack, an, you know, it was a pack animal and hunted in packs. That doesn't mean that velociraptors in Mongolia were, because it would be like saying, oh, look at these wolves, they hunt in packs, and then going and looking at a fox, going, well, that's that's an antisocial thing, isn't it? What, what's the point? So, I mean, I think there is some, and this is me, by the way, this is not paleontology, this is Izzy, saying I think there is some argument that they might have been... Um, quite um i was going to say you social animals that's way too social that's b level i don't mean that's mulgrat level they're not no um they're more social they sort of aggregate in groups and maybe go on attacks together um uh, it's because they're going after this thing There's, they lived alongside protoceratops and as you can see i like to call it the nosferatu ceratops because if you look by its beak it's got these weird fangs just by its beak why why does it have those what was it doing was it bowling was it bowling with its beak and those what why? Why would it do that? Anyway, protoceratops, massive. It goes up to 320 kilo, okay? And they were definitely trying to eat and attack these guys. We know that because we got one in a fight. How amazing is this fossil, okay? This fossil, it shows a velociraptor with its arm trapped in a protoceratops's mouth. This is obviously a smaller protoceratops. <laughs> um, and it's got its claws, it's got that piercing claw in the protoceratops's neck. And they died together and they've quickly been buried by sand. And this is the, <sighs> how amazing is it? How much of a battle is this going? This is incredible. So if you're going after dinosaurs like this, and this is a baby one it's gone after, which makes a lot of sense. It kind of makes sense that you'd go after a big animal in multiple uh, individuals, but that's me theorising. We've got absolutely no idea how big um, the gang size would be. It could be that, you know, um, 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 that they're just like hanging out together. Um, and, you know, we don't know, you know, there's that wonderful bit in uh, Jurassic Park where they blow through the, you know, voice box. We don't know how it communicated. It could have had really amazing feathers that changed, you know, that I was going to say change colour, but you could have communicated using your wing feathers. You could have, you know, movements, dogs use movements a lot. Um, but yeah, we just don't know. And this is the beautiful thing about paleontology. There's so much more to find out. Um, but there we go. So formidability. How scary were they? Um, so in terms of suffragettes, it's pretty scary. This is a, a station that they uh, that they bombed. Um, <laughs> and you've got this is what I mean. See that lady down there? That's Anne Kenny, who is so happy to be being arrested. This is what I mean. They were kind of nuts. She spat in like the face of a police officer and spoke in a place that she wasn't allowed to speak to. She gets arrested. That's the thing. You see a woman there defending herself against the police, i.e., grabbing his stick off him. Um, you have a woman there being picked up. They're just completely unafraid. They just they're the most stubborn people you can possibly imagine, suffragettes, because you know, if you told me to go into prison and one starve myself and two suffer force feeding, I don't I I mm, I don't know if I agree with <laughs> voting that much. I don't know if I could do it. It's severely I mean these these are stubborn people. These are absolutely like and the thing is, like in the films, Velociraptors are sort of represented as being very much together and being really human in their motivation. And I will save you and I will. I'm blue and I love you. And, you know, you're the alpha and all of that sort of thing. And the truth is, most animals will run away. They don't want to attack something that's going to be difficult. They want easy life. There's Velociraptors that you find which have, you know, like, you know, petrosaur wings in them, which they've obviously scavenged and, you know, different. They're not they're not going to attack you. They're probably more scared of you than you are of them. Hmm? Where have you heard that before? So, the results. This is this is my massive result. I hope you've learned a little bit. Well, if you haven't, well, you know, at least it's nearly over. So, uh, here we are. Here, here's my results. Um, so, I would say, in terms of battle cards... So I'm going for size of suffragettes is four. They're still quite small. Women were, by the way, averagely slightly. I think they're meant to be average three inches shorter, which puts me at something like five foot nine. I mean, that's tiny. Um, but um, in, in the 1910s um, and stuff, so they were a bit smaller. Um, both of them, I think they've got a bit of armour, OK, but not a lot. So I, did, I put three. Really, it should be lower than that on both of them. But I was, I was feeling generous. Agility, I'd say seven for a suffragette. They're actually in training. Um, and yeah, and in armour, uh, sorry, in, in, um, in agility for Velociraptor, I think they're really agile. I think they're really amazing. I think they've got the wings to do use as air brakes. Um, wings, wing feathers, arm feathers, long arm feathers. 
good for movement. I think they're quick. Um, I think they've got, you know, the right body for it. I think they've got that cock claw. I think they're really going to be very agile. Um, weapons. Um, I, I'd say they're about equal, even though um, suffragettes um, have bombs and um, um, incendiary devices. They don't have guns. They don't. There's no evidence of suffragettes using guns. They will use martyrdom. So Emily Davidson will sort of, you know, run under a horse. People say, you know, when Emily Davidson gets run over by the, um, the king's horse. Now, people say that that was an accident. She was just trying to pin something on the king's horse. I think I've read because I've read the original documents from the 1912 um, litigation um against um vote for women magazine and in that is all of the sort of you know people involved in it and you can actually read the court documents and emily davidson when she was in prison did try to martyr herself a number of times by throwing herself downstairs and was stopped so she was a bit crazy she was you know out there i'm not sure if it was in an accident which is the modern historical sort of thing again no she was just trying to do this and then actually got caught by the horse i think she might have gone there are cameras here i'm doing it which Good honour. You're not going to get a Velociraptor doing that. Anyway, point is, um, Velociraptors, though, do have naturally good weapons. They've got these great grasping hands. They've got a good bite, not very hard, but a good bite. And they've got that lovely um, claw. So I'm putting them both as equal on weapons. Sociability, I, like I say, I would have given the suffragettes 10, except they were crazy and divided their own groups. So they're down to an eight. Um, sociability and Velociraptors, question mark. Do not know. More research needed, guys. We can't finish the game until we've done more digging. Um, formidability, I'd say, um, like this is how scary the suffragettes were, okay? They were banned from the British Museum. Not just the suffragettes, no, all women. All women were banned from the British Museum. In order to get into the British Library or the British Museum or the National Gallery, you need a, a note, a formal note from a doctor or physician or like a gentleman in society or have a male escort with you, lest you start smashing stuff. Women were seen as proper dangerous, okay? This was not a small issue. Their formidability, people were scared of women. It was amazing. Anyway, uh, formidability, if we're looking at Jurassic Park movies, it's like definitely like 10. If we're looking at reality, we're looking at a scary turkey. Three. So um, I hope you found that uh, very interesting. I hope that you no longer see velociraptors versus suffragettes like this and more, in fact, like this. So you've got to, uh, you know what the result's going to be. If you put, you know, a group of suffragettes up against one antisocial velociraptor, this is how it's going to end up. So with a nice turkey dinner. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, that is my talk. And it is exactly 40 minutes long. And I'm very happy because I didn't know how long it was going to be. It was a very silly talk. I'm not an expert. However, please listen to Terrible Lizards and please buy my book. Um, if you know any short people, it's had really good reviews. It's really good. But if you go to izzy.com and you can follow me, um, you can also listen to a proper... It's proper paleontology on there. It's not just me. I'm the idiot on there. He's the proper paleontologist. I've got, I can see at the moment, it's got Dave's message to you in my Facebook thing flashing. And there's like 47 messages where he's gone, no, no. So I, I will read those and make corrections. But other than that, um, thank you very much for listening. I've been Izzy Lansing. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Izzy. In the meantime, I've acquired a cat and she's oh, well just decided done. that that is just going to happen. Um, but I hope everyone will join me in thanking Izzy. Please thank her with whatever, you know, emojis uh, you have in the chat. Um, and also, please make sure that you go to Slido and you check out the questions, upvote the questions, add your own questions. Um, because now we're going to be taking a bit of a break. Uh, we'll give you about 15 minutes. You can, you know, tell us what you're eating or drinking in the chat. And when we come back, we're going to ask the most upvoted questions. So make sure that, you know, your, your burning question. I mean, I, I've already um, put maybe a question or two, but I mean, if you don't ask your own burning question, then I will ask mine. Um, so just, just make sure you do, you do that over the chat and we will be back in about 15 minutes. So just before eight o'clock.
I hope you all had a good break and got some refreshments. And um, I'm going to be asking some of the questions from Sligo. Uh, I'm just going to, it's a popularity contest. I'm going to ask the most popular questions first and see how far we get. So, <laughs> oh no. Um, some interesting questions. I hope you're ready, Izzy. I'm, you I'm just doing some publicity while, uh, while, while you talk, ask me them. There we go. <laughs> Always visit Izzy.com if you want to learn more or listen to the Terrible Lizards podcast. There you go. Um, <laughs> um, so the first question is, um, at what point did the suffragettes stop being seen as terrorists? Because you did mention that they were basically terrorists. <laughs> they were basically ter- and it, it, it's all to do, I mean, certainly at the time, I think they were considered, uh, depending on who you read, they were considered terrorists or not. They were considered, considered ex- incredibly extreme. I think we've got a romanticised view of them now, a bit like we have a romanticised view of almost everybody. We've got a bit of a romanticised view of Gandhi, we've got a bit of a romanti- romanticised view of um, the movements in the 60s and stuff. It's this idea that, you know, well, people just were very meek and eventually the government gave them what they want because that's how you get things done. You be meek and you wait quietly mm. patience and as a result um i think that's the thing when it became certainly when i was at school we learned about emily davidson but we learned that it was an accident and um this was just oh she's a bit stupid and a bit meek and you know this is what you know we learned they starved themselves we heard about that and how much they suffered but we didn't hear about you know the time when um, like they they had a big charity fundraiser in a swimming pool and dived off diving boards fully clothed after giving speeches and then had a race between men dressed in um, police costumes and suffragettes dressed in dresses uh, just had a race you know in the swimming pool as you do and and dive, and people were chucking coins and they'd dive down and get money from the bottom that sort of thing we didn't learn about the roller skating we didn't learn you know about all the fun stuff either it's a sort of weird idea that we have. But if you want political change, don't do anything. Just suffer quietly and eventually. And I think that's, I don't think there's a big sort of date in time when it changed or when it was one or the other. I think that's always been the sort of thing where you don't want women to be la- noisy. We should be quiet. Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, that's kind of an activist thing as well. I mean, there are current movements as well where they say, oh, oh, well, I haven't seen any. I don't know anything about that. No movements where they're just saying, maybe you should just be meek not do anything very interesting so that mm, interesting parallel there not that history would ever repeat itself no um (laughs) and that actually is not even a segue that i meant to have but uh the next question is how would you compare the suffragettes methods of activism to current blm protests (laughs) blm have got a long way to go if they want to get up to the level of suffragettes i mean really (laughs) BLM are, BLM are just like, oh, aren't they lovely and sweet? This, BLM are suffragists. That's what BLM are. Um, they're not doing anything, really. They're responding to violence, as far as I can see. You might have a few people getting up there and being antagonistic, but that's not the planned attacks. You don't get BLM organising without any social media, by the way. Hey, uh, exactly two minutes to six, we're going to go to a major street and smash every single shop window. Yeah. Don't get that. That's what the suffragettes did in 1912. You know, they just went, right, we're just going to, you know, private businesses, put, you know, people who might have supported the suffragettes, let's just smash the, all their stuff, just, you know, in order to get the right. They they were much more extreme than BLM, much That's more. Interesting. So can you just explain, uh, you know, for the, you've mentioned it a few times, but the difference between the suffragettes and the suffragists? So the suffragettes, so, oh gosh, what they're called, the uh, N-U-W-S-S, that is like the Union of Suffrage Movements for Women, and it's people like Millicent Fawcett, and it's basically all the people, you know, you you could say John Stuart Mill started it back in the 1860s, where he introduced a bill to Parliament saying, I I tell you what, these ladies seem to know what they're doing. How about we let ones over 30 with property have a bit of a, you know, dally in the boat? Um, And everybody went, oh, you can't do that. And to be fair, I mean, the thing is, they let women vote on the Isle of Man. They let women vote in Australia. They let women vote where it has no consequence. Because what we forget is, this was back when Britain was important. So we actually ruled like a quarter, well, a fifth to a nearly a quarter of the planet at this time. So, you know, British votes in this country had an influence to 
the majority of people in India and in South Africa and all over the world. So I say South Africa, that's a bit dodgy, but you know, ball balls, shut up. Anyway, point is, <laughs> point is, um, it, it matters. The, the British vote actually mattered. And we're also forgetting that, you know, before nine, or oh, when was the consolidation bill? I think it was 1912 again, which is why they went violent again. But um, men, a lot of men couldn't vote either because they didn't have property. So it all changed in this sort of time. And the, when the suffragettes were fighting, all these like working class women like Annie Kenny were fighting for the right to vote. They weren't fighting for their right to vote. They were fighting for the women over 30 who were middle class and proper who had a bit of property to vote. So it's all a bit more muddied and complicated than you think. And it's riddled yeah. with classism. Yeah. It's not even sexism. It is just classism. It's the idea that you can't possibly have the working man deciding what we're going to do because it's dangerous. I mean, they might vote for Trump. Well, <laughs> people are saying now, isn't it? Um, yeah. See, this is what happens when you let the working men vote. Um, <laughs> oh, sad. Um, okay, so the next question is um, about, uh, oh, the Christmas dinner question. So if the people, <laughs> have, spoken, the people have spoken and they want okay. to know, if velociraptors were the size of a large turkey, would it make a good Christmas dinner, since they are related to birds and all? Um, I would say, I would say, almost certainly, it would taste like chicken. But um, yeah, no, I, I can't imagine why they're a bit wiry. That's the only thing. They're a bit sort of you want you want to tame the velociraptor, a nice one that's been cooped up for a while. Also, the tails can be hard to fit in the oven. So mm. that tail, because it's not like a turkey which doesn't which has tail feathers. It's got the full long tail. So you're going to have to wrap that around it and sort of you know. I think it's just going to be difficult to sort of, you know, get in there really a bit. But ultimately, it is just a big bird. So, yeah, be fine. I think do it. Do, we, do we remove the tail other that um, other animals that are eaten? I'm asking this as someone who hasn't eaten meat since I mean, like 1994. Well, the, most other animals don't have. We have the parson's nose on a chicken, for example, which is just the, the end bit. But we, we remove the innards and we remove the head, but we don't tend to remove uh, and the feet, weirdly. Um, whereas chicken feet are quite good, but um, yeah, no, but the, there's they're basically very similar because and birds are dinosaurs, they're around at the same time as dinosaurs, and this is you know, they are you know, it, it's a bit like saying you know, dogs and mice are mammals, you know, birds and birds and velociraptors are dinosaurs, it's the yeah, same thing, all right. Um, okay, so suffragettes and um, suffragists had wildly different methods. We've already talked about that. Yeah. But which do you think achieved more for the cause? Could, and furthermore, second question, could we have had one without the other? I think, um, I, I think certainly... You see, this is it. This is it. In terms of marketing, suffragettes really won that one. They, they're the ones we remember. We remember Pankhurst. We remember um, even Edith Garrett, who was, you know, the woman who did jujitsu. Um, they were brilliant at marketing, mainly. And um, but the suffragists probably did more in the long run of more reasoned arguments. Um, ultimately, what won it was the First World War. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> without that, I think it might have taken a bit longer. Um, and that's really what got the working women the vote in, in 1928. So, yeah, yeah. Um, ultimately, um, if you wanted me to, which side I'd be on, I'm a big old coward. I'd have done the jiu-jitsu. I would not have joined the bodyguard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that causality thing is very difficult to tease out in all social events, isn't it? What exactly caused, you know, what led one thing to well, I mean, the other? I mean, this is why, because when I wrote a kid's book, I wrote it, set before it got really violent so i wrote it with black friday in mind when the, it was police violence okay. but before the suffragettes really went into bombing stuff and there's a reason for that is that i can't actually physically justify it that you know it's right to damage somebody's you know business and risk people's lives with bombs I, it was hard to get my head around so sort of going hey kids um violence works yeah. um, but on the other hand violence kind of works um it's very popular most historians now uh, i'll just say the most the, the the opinion is of most historians that um the suffragettes did not do as much as the suffragettes to further the cause of women's right to vote that is the official at the moment right online so okay. we'll say that so, but Pankhurst was cool. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so the kind of 
that does relate to a question um, that was quite a, up at the top. And what that's what prompted you to write a book about the suffragettes and why did you choose to write a book for children? About well, the suffragettes? okay, so, so you know, the, the, the clever answer would be because I've always thought and I always want. No, what happened was I did a piece of Radio 4 um, where um, about the jiu-jitsu suffragettes, which I did my, my friend Naomi Paxton, who's a great um, historical a historian about the suffragette movement. And she um, and, and me got together and I recorded her in my dojo and my producer came and we all got to throw each other and she got to disarm a knife and, you know, stab me and that sort of thing. It was all great. But that got my pick of the week on Radio 4, which doesn't happen very often. And if you're a BBC broadcaster, it's like, oh, so I tweeted this and a few people retweeted that. And then somebody wrote underneath and this lady called Hannah, oh, that make a great kids book. And I was thinking, oh, that's funny. I looked at what she did for a living and she was a children's book editor. So at Bloomsbury, so I immediately replied, went, yes, it would. Yes, it was. Yes, please. Can we have a meeting? Can we have a meeting? Hence how the book came about. So it's entirely random Twitter, well, as in everything these days. That but means, it, it is good. Yeah, <laughs> testament. And also the Jiu-Jitsu Suffragettes is a great band name for sort of a four-piece alt well, rock band. Edith, Edith Garrett actually kept little clippings of herself in all the papers because the whole point is she was sort of like they would do all these sort of big evenings where they'd have like fun events where they do suffrage plays and they'd have music and that sort of thing and she would throw policemen in front of the audience with, usually with her husband who was also a jitsuka explaining what was going on and she'd just be chucking these men around and everybody would go oh brilliant brilliant um, but the the whole the, you know, the, she used to keep little clippings and they called her uh, jit suffragists or suffragitsu. And so there were all these little sort of tags that, in the headlines. And obviously that picture that I showed in the slides of that woman, that was meant to be her. And this is sort of this great joke that women defended themselves until they actually started doing it properly and actually injuring policemen properly. And that wasn't so, that wasn't so good. They were really good at it though. I mean, they trained... They tried to train without harming people too much. I mean, the Indian clubs as well, which I didn't mention, they were actually used to disable police horses. There's a certain point they knew to hit the horse behind the knee, which would just cause the horse just to immediately sit down, not give it any long-term damage, but just sit down with the policeman falling off on top. And they did that quite a lot. So there were little tricks like that that they were quite good at and aren't as sort of creepy and horrible and violent. But, you know, they were out there to cause a problem. Mm, next up, animated series, I think, what I'm getting. Oh, yeah. from. I'm just going to hold this here. I for think that's, I think that's great. I think we should have actually gotten you a little shelf right there. Yeah. I mean, that's what a good, that's what the BBC sort of broadcasters are doing now. They have their little shelves. In the I know. Mine, mine is sort of up. So you can sort of see. This. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so next question we've got. Oh, yeah. If you were to be creating a clone... Jurassic Park style, which of the two do you would feel would be more dangerous to our current society? Ooh, this is like a number of levels here. So you're cloning and which is more dangerous currently? So this is, a, this is an idea of which is, uh, I think the thing is a suffragette now, I think should be quite cool with how things have gone for us. I mean, I think she'd be just like, it's pretty ace. It's pretty ace. And she'd, she'd be going, OK, so what's the next bit that we need to get equalised and that sort of thing? So if she's really extreme, she'll be going, right, we need to change the way that, you know, the laws work so that actually everybody should have their children before they're 18. Between the ages of 16 and 18, that's when you need to have your children. And then nobody can earn any money then. And then the men can stay at home and they can look after the children. And we can go to work and it'll be brilliant. And <laughs> that might be that crazy. Um, <laughs> so reorganise the entire structure of society to favour women. That That's maybe what they'd do. Or they'd be looking around going, well, this is quite nice. Whereas the Velociraptor, that might cause a lot of issues because we've seen what the Jurassic Park films do, and that causes a lot of people to sort of nature finds a way, and all of this sort of stuff, and it'll cause a lot of people to try and make money out of it, which isn't so good. But it'd be really interesting for science. It'd be a really interesting thing to do. So, as a biodiversity researcher, which is what I do, I think I, uh, I, 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 can't, I can't help but feel that, you know, you're kicking nature while it's already down. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you'd be able to see how floofy they were. And that's important. <laughs> I know. I mean, in my head, uh, because I'm of a certain age where I wasn't taught about dinosaurs having all these feathers, they're all, they're, they're not floofy, are they? You they're talk not about uber floofy. 
They're not yeah. going to be uber floofy, but they're going, they're going to be... The thing is, as well, we sort of think, oh, what colour they are, and you can actually tell what colour feathers were. I mean, there are beautifully preserved... Um, feather specimens where you can actually see the feathers and you can look down and um, the way the cells are organized it's a bit like imagine if you bought paint pots in different shapes and that told you what color they were skin cells feather cells scale cells they'll tell you what the color they are by these what are they called they're called melanin melaninosomes i think they're called something like that something like that uh, anyway you can see what color the feathers were so but the beauty of that is you don't know if they were like that for some of the year and they change colour, you know, for the winter. So they were all white in winter. Um, or, you know, maybe they were like male and female might have been really diverse. Maybe they were the same. All of these different, you know, things could have been going on and we just don't know about it. So to actually have a velociraptor here and now and see how it changed depending on the climate you put it in, depending on what gender it was, obviously it would be female. But, you know, it would be interesting. Yeah. So if I were to vote, I would vote. I would. You're cloning. You're ruining nature anyway. Uh, I would definitely vote for um, Velociraptor in that one. I'd be more interested. And you did. You did talk about the Velociraptor in, in Jurassic Park and how um, perhaps they they just didn't feel it would be menacing enough. It was if it was covered in this beautiful plumage, right? Like you talked yeah. about that on your podcast, like the kind of idea that it wouldn't have just been kind of sort of feathery. It would have been very feathery. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is the idea. I mean, the thing with velociraptors, we don't have specimens with feathers on, so we don't know exactly. We know they definitely had those quill feathers, though. Yeah. So they definitely had feathers on their wings. But there are other microraptor, I think, has been discovered covered. I mean, just covered. Just basically flying. Okay. All right. Well, gliding. I'm going for suffragettes. So, um, okay. not that they're just going to be like normal women, except, you know, this is the thing. If you're cloning, you're getting them from a baby. It's just a human woman. I, okay. Uh, I I kind of want to see what would happen, though, with the internet. It, would it, would it, would they become you more... You do this yourself. You don't need to clone. You could just have a baby. It doesn't need to be a clone. There is no genetic <laughs> difference between it. That's Scientifically, we're talking nonsense, you know. Very good point, actually. Um, okay. So... Enough of the fighting. We're stopping the fighting. What what would suffragettes do if they managed to tame a velociraptor? And excellent plug. Velociraptor cavalry is out of the picture. Um, cavalry is out of the picture. But something surely could be done. So you got suffragettes. They've tamed the velociraptor. And this sounds like the start of something very interesting. Well, I hate to say it, but Velociraptor is very sharp teeth, not very strong bite. We don't need a very strong bite. And also the height they are just under waist level. Yeah. If you're a gentleman, they can be trained. Oh, oh. I don't think they would have done that, though. I don't, I don't think they, they never, they never directly tried to harm men, just their money. So they'd only, they were very defensive, but slash will bomb stuff. And we might risk a few people while we get the bomb there. But they weren't, they weren't, let's actually physically murder people. There well, was, there's they kind of evidence like, of them kidnapping, but that never actually came about. Okay, so they say enough of the fighting, though. What might they, how could they maybe harness it in a non-violent way, then? These, well, this, harness the, the trouble is, velociraptors, I mean, I don't think, I think it was the 1920s. No, it wasn't. It was 1960. Was it Ostman? This is when I'm forgetting when velociraptors were discovered. But they, I mean... It was no, it was you know they 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 knew about dinosaurs then they knew about Archaeopteryx then so the fact that they got a life dinosaur might be quite cool people might have come, you know paid to see it ultimately they were mass marketers they were making more money than the Labour Party at this time so they were more popular and that this would just been just another cash generator they would have done exactly what Richard Attenborough would have done. Oh, very interesting. Mm, very uh, entrepreneurial. Yeah. Uh, okay, so what was the name of your favorite dinosaur and why is it your favorite? Uh, okay. Um today my favorite dinosaur is Alvinosaurus, which is tiny. You think Velociraptor's tiny? This thing is like a small chicken. It's about 30 centimeters high. It's about 50 centimeters from nose to tail. And guess what, guys? It was an anteater. And it used to it had these, it had one claw. One claw, and it'd rip into ants and termite nests, and it'd peck. 
it would peck its face. And it had these amazing feet. So it was walking on tiptoes and it had these amazing feet which allowed it to really efficiently run. So it'd run between all these things. So that's the thing. It's very difficult to get all of our energy from these tiny little things and, you know, and basically run from one thing to other. So it's a really efficient runner, really good at that sort of thing. And it, yeah, and it had a little stubby nose to it. But yeah, Alvinosaurus. And it also makes me think of the chipmunks. Yeah. Alvin, Simon, Theodore. So there. I, by the way, um, just so you know, every time I'm asked what my favourite dinosaur is, I always do a different one. <laughs> I, I mean, I think it's totally legit to say your favourite dinosaur today is. Um, exactly. um, the, it does raise a question, though. Um, not on the chat. I'm just going to use my abuse. Okay. My, um, you mentioned that it's kind of we're talking small chicken size. What do you think about this? Uh, if we were to sort of bring back the dinosaur, it would have to be some sort of weird hybrid with the chicken. Have you heard this? Um, well, something's got to lay the egg. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's fair enough if it's a sort of a, a, a dinosaur that's close to, you know, if it's a dromosaur or something like that, but not if it's like a sauropod. That's unfair on the chicken. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, because it'd have to lay thousands of eggs or something. But yeah, no, I mean, I mean, I don't think it's, I don't think it's right. That's the one thing, you know, you know, like those big turtles that lay, they lay eggs on the beach in a big yeah. hole. Yeah. You no know, sauropods, the big long neck ones like um, Diplodocus and Brachiosaurus and all that, sort of, and Titanosaurus. They all lay thousands of eggs at a time. They didn't lay one big egg because structurally that wouldn't work. And they were probably soft, slightly soft shell eggs like you'd get yeah. in a, cool. some of them were anyway, not all of them. But, and they would just lay fields of these eggs and crush them on the way out. And so you get in like India, there's this entire sort of like layers of just dinosaur eggs. Wow. They've been trapped in volcanic ash. Can, uh, are these all things we can learn about on Terrible Lizard? They are indeed. TerribleLizards.co.uk. It is a brilliant podcast said by somebody who knows what they're talking about, not me. Well, tune in to find out more. And you can always oh. go as for all of this, Izzy.com. You can find out about the book, the many podcasts, the BBC radio programs. Yeah, exactly. um, a few more questions. Um, <laughs> So, were suffragettes only focused on the right to vote, or did they also raise other issues, such as those raised by feminists today? We've sort of touched on that. But well, yeah, I mean, they, their main focus was on the right to vote, uh, but people like Sophia Singh were also very socialist, so she wanted um, basically workers' rights as well. She wanted minimum wage, etc. Um, there were also a number of... Um, women who wanted marriage. So Una Dugdale famously, when she got married, she refused to say and obey in her marriage vows. There were very much, there was like talks on everything. So there's wonderful talks on divorce laws and changing divorce to make it cheaper for women so that you have rights over your children. Can you imagine women having rights over their children if they got divorced? How like strange. it came out of their body or something. I know, like, like they'd care. Um, when, it's, when everybody knows children is the man's property um, but yeah so they, they were interested and they certainly educated each other on that and they had these great talks and there were lots of this is how they did it before social media before Twitch they got together in village halls and they sort of chatted about everything and you know had invited speakers much like sceptics in the pub and this is what they would do and, and this is how they'd raise money and how they'd you know champion the right to vote and try and get you know, people alongside. So this it's all how it's done. Um, so yes, they did. And pretty much everything under the sun is what they <laughs> chatted about. Well, that is very interesting. So uh, this is a bit obscure, this next question. I think it kind of makes sense. So if, given the key history of the movement, what is the most likely hypothetical location of Suffragette City? Um, definitely Birmingham because it's right between <laughs> Manchester and London. <laughs> definitely Birmingham, you think? Yeah. yeah. Why? Right between Manchester and London. Right between Manchester and London, which are the key hotspots. Uh, easy to get to Glasgow, right in the centre of the UK. Good manufacturing base, full of women who really sort of you know care about you know the rights and everything else. And also, there's nothing else to do there. I don't know if you've been. It's, I, I, uh, I'm I kidding. I'm kidding, Birmingham. I, I love you. But yeah, it's um, love, why not? Why not? 
Why not? Geographically, and I think you've, you've, you've presented solid reasons for that one. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. This is, uh, okay. We know at least one velocir velociraptor monglo monglogenesis, I can't even say it, died after being bitten by another velocir velociraptor. Any suffragette on suffragette fatal attack? Only if you include suffrage, not that I know of, that doesn't mean to say it didn't happen, it just means they weren't caught, clever, um, but um, only to themselves. So there's quite a lot of, you know, there's quite a lot of people getting injured. I mean, a lot of women died. Uh, the first woman to die from um, being in prisons and being force fed was actually Emmeline Pank, her sister, um, who died over Christmas in 1910. But it, it is that sort of thing of, Ultimately, if they'd had a bite of a sandwich, they would have lived. You know, mm. it's it's brought on themselves. However, it is the people force feeding them when all they want is political rights. It seems a bit. You know, I'm I'm on the side of the suffragettes in that one. However, I don't think I could do it because it's not so much the tube going in; it's being whipped out, mm. and they would suffer damage. I mean, literally, they'd suffer damage. And it, yeah, yes. anyway. So never that mind all of that, but. Okay. Yeah, so uh, you get the spoon, right? You yeah, it's much better types. to be middle class. In, in life in general, it is much better to be middle class. So, you know, I recommend. I recommend. It's lovely. Um, but yeah, so so there was there were ov obviously disagreements and fights um among the suffragettes. Um there were suffragettes who ran away, so often they would flee to France rather than get arrested as well which does suggest that they move farther, faster than velociraptors as well, if you think about it. But yeah, they're, they're, um, there was a lot of infighting. No actual murders I know of. None. Doesn't even happen, though. Yeah, I mean, maybe his future historians will uncover that one. Yeah. All right, I think this will be our, our last question. No Would gosh. dinosaur feathers be better for a duvet or for quills? Definitely quills. I, I I sort of say they're floofy, but they weren't that floofy at the time. This is we know them to be. I mean, this is um, the thing is though they were um, the, the the climate they were in was warm. Um, this is the other thing. So it's not like. But then I'm I'm sort of thinking, you know, would you need the floofy feathers? I mean, but ostriches are quite floofy. I mean, not on their legs, obviously, but they are quite floofy. But. Uh, but then they can survive very cold temperatures like they're around in Toronto Zoo without any, I feel very sorry for the ostriches in Toronto Zoo, but anyway uh, so yes, um, I would say that they're more they're, they're less, they don't need the um, the warmth that you think they do um, okay. so much and it, what might it make a sort of a magnificent quill because it would be sort of ornate well, I, th I don't know if it'd be ornate, but it, I mean, the ones here would be good. They'd be, you know, the ones on the on the wing would be really useful simply because the, if they're mantling like they suspect they are mantling, they'd be very confusing. If Imagine being underneath, you know, a bird of prey or a velociraptor being pinned down with claws, not being know which way to escape because every time you see these shadows of wing feathers around you and then this thing coming down and eating you. Uh, it's amazing. It's amazing. So yeah, um, I, I, I'd love to see. I just want to see what colour they are, really, and hopefully we'll be able to find a Velociraptor that's a bit better preserved, where we might be able to get some idea of the colour of their feathers and maybe even the shape of their feathers. But it does require a bit of digging. And maybe you could, you know, somehow get a suffragette, a modern, a modern day equivalent, to then write a pen a letter with the quill. With a quill pen, um, no, no, summarize it. It would it would just summarize the entire evening, wouldn't it? And really eating a turkey sandwich at the same time. <laughs> but if, you, if you want to, there. Are, um, uh, one thing we're going to do on Terrible Lizards. This is a plan anyway. Over Thanksgiving, Christmas sort of time, we're going to get a turkey and take it apart and show you which bits are dinosaur and which bits are not. Oh, so I'm going oh. to eat that turkey. Very yeah. good. So, um, so you're in your second season now. Is there anything yeah. else? that you want to plug before we wrap it all up? What, other than Izzy.com and the Terrible Lizards podcast and the Unstoppable Letty Peg, um, no, that, that, that'll do for now, that'll do. Um, coming up on Terrible Lizards, I think our next guest, I think, is Rebecca Watson, then after that's Phil Plate, and then we've got Robin Ince later on in the series. If you want to listen to the previous series, we've got some amazing guests on that too, um, including people like Tom Holland. Um, so, yeah, do 
do please um you don't even have to listen if you just download it that will make me really happy um obviously if you do love it support us on patreon i think oh, i don't have it on me but um yeah if you if you want to if you want to do all that that'd be amazing and i'd be very grateful but um on that find me on twitter and stuff i'm izzy lawrence and yeah izzy uh-huh. That, that will take you to all all things Izzy. So I hope that you can all, you know, show some gratitude to Izzy down in the um, the chat box and join me in giving you a very um, hearty thank you for everything that you've done. Um, so uh, we will be all gathering together after this in Lock-In's Razor if you all want to join and grab a drink. Um, I never introduce myself, but I'm Sarah Clement with uh, Merseyside Skeptics, so I hope that's all been okay for you. Our next event, let me just pull this up so I don't get it wrong, is called Take the Red Pill, don't stop there, Understanding the Allure of Conspiratorial Thinking Among Proud Boys with Samantha, Samantha Kuttner. So you can find that on our website, on various meetups and Twitter and Facebook. We've got it posted um, everywhere. You can read more about what that talk is about, but I think you can gather a bit uh, <laughs> from what that's about. So thank you everyone for coming and for you know asking really interesting questions and for participating in the chat. I see that I've lost my cat, but make sure that you check out izzy.com, Terrible Lizards, and where's the book? Oh, hang on. Ah. I'm really out of and the unstoppable Letty Peg. <laughs> Make sure you check out the book. So thank you very much. <laughs>